Conventional Soldier, a military podcast brought to you by two British Army veterans in association with ISAR.com. Welcome to the Unconventional Soldier podcast. Our guest today is Jim. He's our first guest from senior service and he serves a Royal Navy clearance diver. On this episode, we're going to cover the unit's history, role, selection process, diving technology and operational deployments. Finally, we'll finish off with Desert Island Dits, Jim's choice of book, film and luxury item. So thanks for coming on the pod. And as usual, we'll start off with your backstory and how you end up serving the Royal Navy as a clearance diver. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on, guys. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, so, yeah, I joined the, uh, the Navy in 2001. I chose the senior service specifically because that's where the clearance diving branch was. I did have a little bit of uh, family service history. My grandfather on my dad's side uh, was in the Royal Navy during the Second World War uh, and had an uncle that was in the RAF. But that wasn't really what influenced me. I, I just always wanted to be in the military since, uh, since I was a kid. I chose a uh, diver. Um, well, it's hard to say why. I sort of picked it out of thin air. But my dad's uh, business associate at the time was a ship's diver in the Navy. That, that at the time was an additional qualification. So uh, volunteers would, would come uh, to Horsey Island. They'd do a four-week air diving course, which culminated in a ship's bottom search phase. They'd then be qualified as ship's divers, um, and they'd go back to their ships and form part of the, the ship's diving team. Uh, unfortunately, that unit doesn't exist anymore. They were, they were sort of phased out in the, the mid-2000s, uh, and clearance divers sort of took over their roles. But um, my dad knew a bit about that because of that, and he, sort of, he said that it was the hardest thing he'd ever done. He also mentioned um, when the divers died out in the mud uh, in the late 80s. Do you guys recall that? Yeah, I remember there was a couple of deaths there, wasn't there? Yeah. Um, it was actually army divers. Not not um, navy divers, but yeah, there are, there are a couple of army divers that died doing mud runs uh, on the mud flats outside Horsey Island. And my dad was sort of telling me about that as well, and for whatever reason, that kind of sold it to me as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I, I I joined up in two thousand one, as I say. Uh, I went in as a direct entry diver. You never used to be able to do that. You used to have to do uh, three years service uh, in another branch of the navy or another part of the military before you could come over and try out. So it wasn't uncommon to have guys that would drop at least one rank, maybe even two ranks, uh, in order to come and be clearance divers. Um, it was offset maybe by the, the additional pay you get for being a clearance diver, but um, it shows sort of how much people wanted to do it. Uh, so I was quite lucky, really, to come in uh, at that sort of direct entry level. And from when I went through up until now, uh, it's, a sort of, it's a mixture of guys on course you'll have direct entry guys who are generally a little bit younger, a bit more sort of inexperienced, uh, and then some sideways entry guys who obviously they've been around a bit more. They generally have a bit more about them, to be fair. Um, and also uh, quite a few guys from other branches of the military, um, specifically from the Royal Marines. Um, for whatever reason, the branch has been quite popular with them over the years. Um, I had uh, one of my course, in fact. Do you get any army guys going across, or it just tends to be sort of no, you do. Yeah, I, quite a few, actually. Um, quite a few army guys will come across directly or they will leave the army and then come and join up, if you like. Um, there was one on my course. Uh, they come from sort of various units. There's even been a few paras, uh, believe it or not, over the years. Yeah, it's, they, they come from all branches. Uh, there's one guy I knew from the RAF as well. Proper tri-service then. Yeah, yeah. It's, and as I say, it seems to be particularly popular with the Marines. And I guess they... It might be a bit easier for them because they're sort of technically part of the Navy anyway. Mm. Although they don't like to admit that. Well, they are. They are the Navy. <laughs> so, Jim, tell us a little bit of the history of the clearance divers there in the Royal Navy. The history of the, the diving branch, really, they can they can trace their roots, their sort of lineage back to a number of units from the Second World War. Um, I think it's similar to a lot of the specialist units within the, the British military now. Um, they can trace their history back to... Um, one or a number of units that were sort of set up during the Second World War, because obviously that was a kind of breeding ground at the time for kind of sort of unconventional units. And our branch was no different. And there's there's quite a few units that we can sort of lay claim to. Um, first of all, you had the, the bomb and mine disposal units in Gibraltar. So uh, Allied shipping in Gibraltar at the time was getting sort of quite severely attacked um, by Italian frogmen from a unit called uh, Decima Flotilla Mass. Um, 
basically they, they were quite advanced uh, probably the first true sort of frogman unit they had rubber suits and fins uh rebreathers and even human torpedoes they were coming to gibraltar harbour sort of at night and lay limpet mines on shipping and kind of cause chaos so the royal navy set up these sort of localized teams in gibraltar in order to counter that um, it was done in kind of typical british military fashion they had no kit um, I think initially they were diving in shorts and T-shirt uh, and using submarine escape uh, breathing apparatus. Um, they got sort of better kit as time went on. They, they actually stole some from the Italians that they captured. And just of interest with this unit, Buster Crab, um, Lieutenant Commander Buster Crab, was a member of this unit. Uh, and he was actually awarded a GC for, for his actions um, while working with them. Uh, he obviously became more famous a little bit down the line uh, when he was working for the intelligence services uh, and, and went missing in 1956. Uh, we also had Royal Navy EOD units. Uh, so these were non-diving EOD units, um, probably not dissimilar to the Army, operated on land. I think they predominantly operated in the UK, dealing with, obviously, uh, German-dropped air weapons and mines, etc. Of note of this unit, uh, of interest, uh, there was a chap called Spencer Kaufman, uh, who became Admiral Spencer Kaufman, uh, he was an American. He tried to join the US Navy and he'd been uh, refused on medical grounds. So he came over to the Royal Navy. He went pretty much straight into the EOD unit, uh, so applied his trade there for a while. And then when America came into the war, he went back to the States uh, and was instrumental in setting up the underwater demolition teams. I don't know if you've heard of them before. Um, they were the kind of closest equivalent I think we had to clearance divers. From them in the 60s, you then had the Navy SEALs. That's, that's a really that's, interesting bit of history that I never knew about. There, yeah, so, so, so yeah, so the SEALs were born from them. The both units coexisted for a number of years. They did the same selection procedure, but then went off and did sort of different uh, continuation training. But yeah, the founder of all of that was uh, trained by the Royal Navy. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> um, you had landing craft obstacle clearance units, uh, pronounced lock use. These guys were sort of instrumental, uh, really, in... in uh, helping to clear the beaches on D-Day. So they went in covertly ahead of the kind of amphibious landings and basically blew up um, obstacles um, to clear sort of channels for the, the landing craft to come in. Did they do any sort of the recce as well, you know, like the, the sand and all that, that? No, so that that was a unit, again, we, we could probably we could probably lay a little bit of claim to them, but I think um, other units will as well. The um, They were called the COPS. Uh, co uh, combined operations pilotage parties who, who went in in the kind of weeks before the landings uh, and and did the beach gradients and all that kind of that kind of stuff. Um, these guys were more going in and doing that kind of um, that covert beach clearance EOD kind of role. Right. Yeah. And they had sort of fairly decent kit because obviously this was a bit later on in the war. Uh, they had sort of rubber suits, oxygen rebreathers, um, fins, uh, and they even had a, an early form of flat jacket they would wear underneath of their their dry suit uh, to sort of protect them from underwater explosions. They were arguably the first sort of ashore in D-Day. Uh, they don't really get the, the recognition they probably deserve. The last surviving one actually had a bit of a do last year at the um, Diving Museum in Gosport, and some of the lads from the branch went down there, so that was, that was good to see. And a rebreathing set, Jim, if I'm right, that doesn't leave a trail of bubble. I'm being very lame in here. So <laughs> yeah, do, do you know what? Because I, I, I mentioned rebreathers throughout the podcast, so I might as well sort of cover that now. Um, so, yeah, you're, you're quite right. Rebreathers... They come in various forms and various gas mixes, and they've been around, as I say, since really arguably before the war. But basically, you recirculate the gas you're breathing. It gets, you sort of breathe it in one side, it, it goes, you breathe out, it goes through a CO2 scrubber, which takes out all of the CO2. It then comes back into the loop, and you, and you sort of breathe it again. Um, obviously, if you keep doing that without gas being added, you run out of gas. So, you, with regards to electronic rebreathers, which we use now, um, your gas gets. Uh, it goes past oxygen sensors that measures the amount of oxygen that's in the breathing loop and it will kind of add gas in as it goes and the benefits of rebreathers really from a military standpoint are they don't give away bubbles um, so if you're doing anything covert obviously no one can see you um, they're acoustically uh, sound as well that's big for us obviously if we're dealing with mines that might have sort of diver uh, sort of tamper measures on them uh, and they especially the modern ones they have really good endurances so you can dive on a rebreather for sort of up to four hours. So yeah, that's that's on rebreathers. Basically, it reuses your gas and it doesn't leave telltale bubbles. There were then uh, chari charioteer units. Um, basically, the Royal Navy was kind of 
inspired by the Italian frogman operations and the, the kind of mini subs they were using. And they set up chariot units, um, which were mini subs that were piloted by two Navy divers, basically. Um, they'd sit astride of them and they used those to conduct operations against Axis shipping. Um, it would either have a warhead on it or they might plant a limpet mine. Uh, and they also did some beach reconnaissance stuff from them as well. These uh, attacks on shipping, it must be, was this a suicide mission more or less, or did the guys no, get away? No, no, no. No, so sorry. When I say when I say human torpedoes, although I think the Japanese did actually do something like that, um, I don't think anyone uh, from our sort of side of the pond did. Um, they would go in covertly, lay the explosives, and then come away. And was the success rate of getting away quite high? Because I'd imagine, you know, it's a very high risk environment that yeah I, I believe it was to be fair um i don't think too many of them sort of were captured um and the same goes for the italians as well i think they were quite successful obviously if, if you kind of get in without being seen and plant the mine you, you've got plenty of time to kind of get away um as long as you do it all right mm. so um i don't think i don't think too many of them were actually killed you then had uh, port clearance parties or p parties these were Sort of set up after D-Day, just because of the the vast quantities of unexploded ordnance that had been left over after the sort of D-Day invasion uh, and beyond. These units sort of would dive in the harbours and basically sort of clear unexploded ordnance. They were one of the few units, I believe, that lived on past the war, and ended up being one of those that was amalgamated into the the diving branch when it was eventually formed. A little known one, you had X-craft divers. So, have you guys ever heard of the X-craft? These little three-man subs. No, yeah, they were yeah. using D-Day as part of the recce as well, I believe. Oh, were they? I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah, they sat off the that. coast and they were doing a reconnaissance. Oh, okay. No, I didn't know that. Um, but yeah, these things were you know, pretty crazy. They, they were submarines, so you were dry inside them, if you like. But they literally were three-man crews. But everyone had a, a Navy diver on board um, whose job it would be to exit the submarine while it was submerged, to clear the submarine if it became fouled, or if they were going into a... Uh, to a harbour to do an attack they may have to cut through anti-sub netting that kind of stuff and they could also be used to lay explosives there was actually a, a guy on uh, on one of these called uh, James Joseph McGuinness who was actually a Belfast born uh, Navy diver and he was awarded the VC uh, I think along with the crew that he served with for his actions against uh, Japanese shipping in July 45 so sort of right towards the end of the war it's really strange because I don't think the Royal Navy gets the credit for what it did in the Second World War. It seems to be the RAF and the Army have overshadowed it, but you know, without the Royal Navy having yeah. the reach and uh, and what it did, and for some bizarre reason, it doesn't get the, the sort of the same kudos. Yeah, I think you're right, um, and not just these units. I mean, these units don't get the kudos they deserve, but yeah, the Royal Navy as a whole, and it was you know it was it was damn sort of dangerous work being you know doing these sort of Atlantic convoys or whatever. Getting sort of trying to avoid the wolf packs, you know, the <clears throat> the German U boats. Um, they and they were instrumental in sort of winning the war. But I think you're right. The army and the RAF seem to get a lot of the shine. But anyway, yeah, yeah. So as, as I said, most of these units were disbanded after the war, as was the case for a lot of the other kind of units, you know, that that were the private armies or whatever that were formed. The RN did retain a an ongoing diving and EOD capability, and the modern diving clearance diving branch was formed um, in 1952 as an amalgamation of the port clearance divers, um, shallow water divers, and uh, hard hat divers. You know, the old brass helmet guys. All right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, th- and it was formed as an amalgamation of that in 52, as I said. Um, they initially worked out of HMS Vernon in Portsmouth, um, which is now actually Gun Wharf Keys. I don't know if you guys have been to Portsmouth recently, but it's a shopping centre now, uh, and there's some bars and stuff. But there is a, a memorial to the divers as a, a a statue there of two divers diving on a mine, which is quite impressive, actually. And then they moved to Horsey Island in Portsmouth, which kind of became the HQ of the branch and also home of the Defence Diving School. And then since since then, the, the branch has been active, really, in, in operations all over the world. Um, and it's been deployed in, in pretty much every major conflict that the UK has been involved in. Would you say in the Second World War, because I knew about the Italians having that sort of initial capability that sort of led the way, but... By the end of the war, would it be safe to say the Royal Navy were leading the field in diving operations like that? Or yeah, be- probably. I think um, I think we were at least up there. I think it's fair to say that the British military as a whole was leading the field in quite a few areas. And I think, um, yeah, we probably were. We 
the Italians had their unit, but we sort of had a number of, sort of specialist units and a lot eventually, uh, you know, a lot of experience. Uh, and obviously that then fed into the clearance diving branch because it was only formed a few years after the war ended. Moving on then, what is the role of the unit today? Yeah, so uh, obviously I talked about sort of various roles there and, and really the role is a, an amalgamation of a lot of those and a lot of it hasn't really changed hugely since the war. Um, we've, other than some additional roles have been picked up and we're obviously using sort of more sophisticated kit these days. But it's probably best to look at the clearance diving branch as the, as the Navy, but also the military's sort of primary uh, universal diving unit. They sort of really are jacks of all trades. They're trained to conduct a variety of tasks, um, and they have a, a number of different teams for different jobs, which I'll sort of touch on a bit later. There are other diving units within the military. Um, you've got uh, army divers, uh, predominantly from the Royal Engineers. I, I don't know if you guys had much to do with them in your time. No, not really, no. No, no. Really. Do you know anything about them? <laughs> did, you, did you know they were around? I knew, I, I, I knew that the Royal Engineers had uh, divers, but yeah. I didn't understand to what extent the, you know, the capability was. So, yeah, they, they train also at the Defence Diving School, so we, we, sort of, uh, we have kind of cl- fairly close ties to them. They only train on air, so they dive on surface-applied air. Uh, with you know, with the kind of the yellow hard hats, all right, yeah. s- similar to they use in the North Sea, uh, and they use uh, the sabre set, which is basically like the the NATO or the military scuba set, if you like. Um, and they do a lot of stuff. They go quite deep into the engineering side of things, and they're very, very good at what they do. They're very professional. And again, they don't get a huge amount of recognition. I don't think there's guys I know or or, or have heard talk about the uh, the engineer diver course. Uh, and guys who know what they're talking about, and they've said that it's at least as hard as the All Arms course or P Company, uh, if not worse. So it gives you an idea of the intensity of the course, but they just don't really get the recognition they deserve. Yeah, that, that, the course is known for its arduousness, and I think, uh, as you said, there was a, a number of people died in the sort of the late eighties. Yeah, I initially thought that was from your branch, but now it transpires the Royal Engineers. So yeah. yeah, that's right, and yeah, sadly we've had uh, quite a few die as well. Um, over the years there were even around the time that i was in um there were three guys within a few years of each other that died in training so yeah it's it, it is it's tough and it's, it's dangerous as well inherently uh, because of what you're doing but yeah as well as the engineers that you obviously of course also have the sps they really utilize diving sort of for, for covert kind of stuff uh counter-terrorism operations etc we have a, a wider variety of roles and kit that we use uh, but we do kind of we cross over in certain respects into both areas of the other two, if you like. So when I served in the branch, it was broken down um, into into teams, and and that's the way it had been for a lot of its existence. Since I came out, there's been a couple of changes or a couple of iterations, which I will touch on. To be fair, the roles haven't changed. Uh, it's really the names of the units have changed, which I don't know. It probably got someone promoted uh, or something, um, but but not a lot more has changed than that from what I can gather. Um, funny enough, I was actually chatting with a, I won't try and give away who it is, but I was chatting with a senior rate the other day and, uh, I was asking him, what's the setup like now? And he said, to be honest with you, I don't really understand it. He goes, it's basically the way it was just with sort of different names. So somebody's got a, a, a gong out of it. Some, so someone's got an MBE or something, haven't they? So yeah. <laughs> Hides the budgets. Yeah, 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 exactly. But I'll, I'll touch on how it was when I was in, because that was how it was for a long time. And then I'll explain sort of what it looks like now. First of all, you have clearance diving teams and mine hunters. Um, although we're part of the Royal Navy, uh, divers don't really do a great deal of time at sea. The only ships that we really serve on are actual mine hunters as part of the ship's company. You also get small contingents on Arctic survey ships, but for the most part, it's just mine hunters that we serve on. Mine hunters are fairly small. Um, they're made of plastic because they they've got to be kind of uh, magnetically sound for going into minefields, and they've got crews of only about forty. To 45 uh, guys and cds usually have teams of sort of five or six on those mine hunters and are actually classed as part of the the ship's weapon system uh, and their main role is to counter sea mines that are found um, you only spend a minimal time or, or minimal part of your career at sea, as i say and the majority of the time is actually spent on the land-based diving teams where you get a lot of your experience and training so yeah when i was in you had um the domestic bomb disposal teams um, that provided 24-7, 365 cover, EOD cover and IEDD cover, which is improvised explosive device disposal cover um, throughout the whole of the UK, uh, including Nord- Northern Ireland. And they were able to operate both in water and on land as well. So you had Southern Diving Unit 1, 
uh, down in Plymouth. You had Southern Dove in Unit 2, uh, known as the Pompey Bomb Team in Portsmouth, uh, who I spent a little bit of time with. And also the Northern Diving Group, which is effectively two teams in one, uh, based up sort of near Faz Lane, uh, covering obviously the north of England, Scotland and Northern Ireland. Northern Diving Group also had the additional role of working on the submarines up in the dockyard, because uh, obviously that's where they were. So they got a lot of sort of in-water time doing sort of engineering stuff on the subs. So if you see a um, an EOD wagon with Royal Navy markings, Jim, I take it yeah. they'll be uh, the CD teams, will they? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so Royal Navy Bomb Disposal, that is um, the domestic clearance diving teams. Um, and really, they're, they're exactly the same as the Army ones, um, just we have that added capability of being able to deal with stuff in the water as well. In fact, actually, just on that, these are the these are the teams that find their way into the news actually more so than the others. I don't know if you remember a few years ago there was that uh, World War Two bomb found at the City of London Airport. Yeah, yeah. It closed the whole airport down, so that was Southern Diving Unit Two um, that went and dealt with that. Um, so yeah, when you see that on the news, that's who it is. You then got the Fleet Diving Units, um, which are all based at Portsmouth. They come under or did come under the Fleet Diving Group, and they sort of have different sort of specialist roles. Um, you had Fleet Diving Unit 4, uh, which is the reserve diving unit. Uh, it was made up of ex-regulars. You couldn't be a civvy and go into it. It was ex-regulars only. Their main role was to augment teams, uh, usually in time of war. Um, so they, they would be reactivated for, obviously, for instance, uh, Gulf War One, the invasion of Iraq, etc. Uh, you had the Fleet Diving Unit 3. Uh, this was the deep water warfare team. They also provided the mine initiation and exploitation capability. Um, so if you wanted to recover a mine without blowing it up, uh, so you could get intel on that mine, for instance, to work out how to defeat it, um, that's the team that specialises in doing that. They're a good team. I, I spent a, a, a few months with this team while my ship was in refit, and uh, they were known as Team Manana because they were pretty chilled out. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was, I had a good laugh with them. Um you then had Fleet Diving Unit 2. This was the unit I spent a fair bit of time on. Uh, it was, throughout its existence, it was the Worldwide Ops team. And then they took on, um, after Gulf War One or, or, or around that kind of time, the very shallow water role. So clandestine beach clearance operations, um, similar to the lock queues I mentioned earlier on D-Day, mm -hmm. the kind of modern version of that, if you like. There was, over the years, there was a bit of crossover between this unit and the SBS as well. Uh, there was a, a permanent swap draft at a moment in time between an SBS sergeant and a PO diver, but they got rid of that in the 90s, I believe. The team, when I was on uh, in times of war, actually came under three commando brigade because of that sort of amphibious element, you know, beach clearance element we brought to the, to the table. And then Fleet Diving Unit 2 and 3 also provided the branches contingent for the, the Joint Rapid Reaction Force. So... Uh, if something kicked off and it needed clearance divers, um, you would have a, a sort of six-man unit that would be ready to go at sort of short notice. And for that reason, we had to attend sort of quite a lot of um, training courses and, and pre-deployment courses, particularly for Iraq and Afghanistan, just so we were aware of the current intel picture and, and what was going on at the time. And then you had finally Fleet Diving Unit 1. This was primarily the Maritime Counterterrorism Unit, known as MCT. They worked uh, very closely with UKSF particularly the SBS, uh, and provided uh, assault IED capability for UKSF operations. You mentioned there, Jim, sorry to interrupt you, you mentioned there that uh, you sort of went between, you spent a lot of time in one of the diving units, but you were in another. Is it, is there much interposting between the units in order to, but are the skills yeah. too specific? A hundred percent. Yeah. So you will, throughout your career, you will most likely, obviously you'll spend time on the, the, the teams at sea, and then you'll probably you're likely to probably go on all of the fleet teams at one time or another if your career is long enough. So you'll move around from unit to unit as your career goes on. Because a real widespread um, of skills you're developing there, isn't it? It's... It is, yeah. You, you pick up a lot of skills and a lot of training as you go through. It can take sort of quite some time to get trained uh, in those kind of additional qualifications. But yeah, you'll, you'll move around from team to team as your career goes on, but you will spend a good few years on each team while you're there. Just on fleet team one, whenever you see sort of... Uh, in the news, uh, like the SBS have raided or done an assault on a ship or something, like one happened recently, you generally have clearance divers lurking in the background as well. So as I said, the, the branch has had a couple of restructures since I was in. Uh, it had its most recent one earlier this year, 
the capabilities are pretty much all the same, but they now come under the Diving and Threat Exploitation Group, uh, known as DTXG, based in Portsmouth. And they've been broken down into squadrons. So you now have Alpha Squadron, which was uh, FDU-1 slash the Tactical Diving Group. Uh, and this is now the uh, Naval Special Ops Group, um, based at Portsmouth. Uh, and the role is obviously very similar to that of FDU-1, um, but I think they've taken on a few more things as well. You then have Bravo Squadron. Uh, this was formerly the Southern Diving Group. So, again, that role hasn't changed. It's uh, it's the 24-7 EOD coverage across the country. Charlie Squadron, Northern Diving Group. Delta Squadron, that was formerly uh, Fleet Diving Unit 2. They, additionally to what they do in terms of uh, their beach clearance role, they also now provide a diving and in-water maintenance repair support for the entire fleet. Um, so if a ship needs need something doing, um, they'll be the ones that have flown out to go and do it. Also, part of the reason why that's been brought in probably is because of the loss of ship's divers a few years ago, because ships don't have that ready diving capability. Um, so they now have to fly out teams of CDs to go, and, to go and do the work. And that unit now, it also acts as part of the future commando force. I don't know if you've sort of seen that name bounded around. Yeah, I had a quite um, a bit, yeah. Yeah. Um, so they provide the, the, the kind of the mixed gas EOD diving sort of capability and they're also able to operate uh, on land and do EOD, uh, sort of integrate with the commando forces. That's another aspect of the Navy that Kevin and I often talk about recently is um, how much they've grabbed the bull by the horns and, and focused on the, the future commando force and sort of modernising the Royal Navy. And even down to things like, you know, the recruitment adverts for the Royal Navy are, are, are so much better than what the Army's doing. Yeah, to be fair, you know, when, you're, when you've are when you served, you kind of look at them and sort of raise your eyebrows a bit, but... Um, I don't think they're too bad now. You know, if you're if you're a prospective kind of person that wants to join up, um, I think they actually sell it reasonably well. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the point. You you got to look at it from a, a kid's point of view, and not <laughs> not a crusty old fart. Like yeah, me. exactly. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Some washed up old bugger that's uh, a little bit sort of jaded. <laughs> no, I think I think the commando, uh, the adverts, and the obviously the documentaries have been coming out about the future commando force yeah. as well. They're really marketing yeah. well. Actually, I must say, I think some of the, the documentaries that have come out recently, actually, they, they've yeah. been a little bit less pink and fluffy than they've previously been. Yeah, no, they're good. Uh, which has been quite good to see. And then, yeah, and then finally you've got uh, Echo Squadron. That was formerly uh, Team 3, and they, they retain the same role, the mine initiation exploitation sort of role. That's a sort of a, a basic outline of the branch as it's set up now. Although, although they're called the squadrons, I don't imagine they're massive amounts of people in each group. No, they aren't. So if I go off, um, if I go off sizes when I was in, you're probably looking at sort of twenty guys per team, if that. Yeah. Um, the branch is small. It's it's only about maybe two hundred to three hundred guys. So it's going to be um, really busy all the time, isn't it? You're going yeah. to be committed all the time to something. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah. Do you, do you much of a retention problem, Jim? Because I imagine all these skills you're, you're accumulating here, they must have a real good commercial value outside the service. Yeah, it seems to happen. It seems to come round. I think every so often. And and when I left, I did seven years. And when I left, uh, it just so happened that at that time, there were a number of guys from my era which were leaving at the same time uh, in order to go and work in the, the kind of oil and gas industry predominantly. Because, yeah, it's, it's by no means a guarantee you're going to get a job in that industry, but it is you definitely have a step up and an advantage. And obviously, there's a lot of ex-military guys within that world. And also the private security world as well. Um, it's not just the commercial diving. There's also sort of EOD stuff um, that the guys get involved in as well. So as a specialist unit then, what is the selection procedure? And can you take us through it? Yeah, sure. So um, like any kind of any unit like that, it, it has a selection course uh, and then a training course, if you like. So in order to get uh, onto a, a clearance divers course, you have to pass a week-long uh, selection slash diving aptitude, which is held at the Defence Diving School at Horsey Island. Um, I've probably mentioned Horsey Island a few times already, but it's, uh, as I say, it's the home of the diving branch and where the Defence Diving School is. And it's got a lake there, which is a 1,000 metres long uh, and 10 metres deep. And it used to be a torpedo test range uh, way back in the day uh, before the branch took it over for, for sort of training. And then just outside, you've got the mud flats just outside of Horsey Island as well. So they're sort of conveniently right there for when they want to beast you out there. So, yeah, historically, um, the, the aptitude failure rate was very high. Uh, for sort of various reasons, uh, as much as anything else, because of the sort of physical and psychological pressures that you're kind of under. It was really not uncommon for only one or two people to actually pass the aptitudes. And you only get two tries 
uh, they were kind of run a bit sporadically from what I could see at the time. They, they would run them when they needed to make up numbers on, on, for courses or whatever. For the direct entries, as, as I was, you would, you would go and do your basic training. You would have, you'd say that's eight weeks at HMS Rally doing kind of the basic boot camp stuff you would expect. You pass out from there, you have a night with your family, and then on the, the Sunday you get driven to Portsmouth and you're, you start the aptitude that Monday morning. You only get two tries at it. I don't know if that has changed. And I'll just sort of talk through the, the selection sort of process and how it works. So on day one, you get there, you get a sort of a quick briefing in the morning. The briefing we got was uh, effectively, we, we are going to do horrible things to you kind of thing. And then you, you get straight into your, uh, your PT kit and you go and do the diver's fitness test, uh, which consists of a, a mile and a half squad run, uh, immediately followed by a mile and a half run in under, I think it was nine and a half minutes. And then you've got to do uh, pull-ups and dips uh, and sit-ups, uh, a certain amount of each. That's actually a bit of a stumbling hurdle. Some people fail that. Uh, and if you fail that, you're off, you're gone. They then, you then go and draw your, your kit that you'll be using for the week. So you go and draw your, your dry suit, your woolly bear undersuit, your knife and your suit inflation bottle. Just, just incidentally, anything you do on the aptitude and on training is all done in a dry suit. So you don't get any of your kind of Gucci kit until you finished. The dry suits we were using when I was in were like these old rubber dry suits that had been worn by, you know, thousands of other people kind of previously. Uh, <laughs> and they, they always leaked uh, without fail. So it's just it's just another thing to kind of add to the misery, if you like. But you draw your kit, then they take you through fast dressing. So throughout the aptitude and course, um, when the code word awkward is called, you have to get dressed into that kit within two minutes. Uh, anything over that two minutes sort of incurs penalties the reason for that is uh, it, it comes from operation awkward which was if you thought there were saboteurs for instance trying to put limpet mines on your ship they would call awkward and you'd have to get dressed as quickly as possible get your diving kit on and get in the water to go and deal with it kind of thing so i think that's where it sort of came from they then take you through swim circuits uh, still still that monday morning you, you, they take you out and you do swim circuits uh, which consists of jumping off a, a 10 meter diving board into horsey lake swimming across running all the way around uh, and then back up onto the diving board. And you repeat that three times. And basically you do that every single morning when you come in, irrespective of what, what else you're going to do that day. You'll do your, at least your minimum three swim circuits uh, and then you'll do other things on top of that. The reason for those is, is, is obviously to build up your sort of your endurance, your CV endurance, uh, your, your leg strength with regards to finning. But also it's a good way of just clearing out the sinuses because you get that sort of salt water ingress into into your ears and your nose and it just clears out your sinuses a bit um so you can hopefully clear your ears when you go diving so yeah you you do the circuits and then they basically they sort of rush you up to the the compression chamber um and they press you down to make sure you can clear your ears and again this is a, another stumbling block for some of the guys because some people they may just be having a bad day uh for whatever reason they've got a cold or something or they just physiologically can't clear their ears and that gets rid of some people as well you're then introduced to the uh, to the swimmer air breathing apparatus known as a Sabre set. Uh, as I sort of said earlier, it's an open circuit, effectively a scuba diving set. And that's what you dive for the duration of the the aptitude. Is that just like uh, a, you, you do for doing like recreational sports dive as a Sevy seems? It's the it's the military version of that, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um basically, yeah. It's 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 obviously made a bit more complicated because it's the military of course but um but it's effectively that so you learn about the set you learn your sort of emergency drills you learn um a bit of basic diving physics uh, some do's and don'ts when you're in the water and you learn some light line si signals um when you're on course and on the aptitude you, you'll always be attached to a light line with a blob to the surface so the instructors can see where you are uh, and you can send each other signals through that line so you cover those and then that's the kind of admin phase, if you like, of the aptitude over. Uh, and then then that's it. You're, you're, you're basically getting dived to death uh, and getting beasted for the rest of the week. And yeah, all sorry, you, I, know, I know all of you is when you start, none of you, potentially none of you have ever dived before, have you? Yeah, a, a lot of us hadn't. And there were some, uh, there were some issues, I think, really, around the time I was going through. At, at the time, the Navy provided next to no information on what the role was about. Uh, and what the training and selection procedure was going to be, uh, and even what the, the the standards of the fitness test were, it would all be sort of helpful stuff to have known. You only really found out about stuff as you were going through basic training. You would hear kind of horror stories about things. Uh, you would be told the the, the, the fitness requirements sort of thing. So you were then having to go 
and do training in your own time while you're doing basic training to try and make sure you could do everything properly. So what, what it kind of meant was that you had lads that sort of had signed on the dotted line, you know, um, gone through basic training and they still hadn't gone near a dive set by that point uh, without really realising what they were going to get themselves into. So actually a lot of the, the guys that came through as, as direct entry divers um, never passed the aptitude and never, and never qualified as divers uh, at the end of the course. And then you, you'd have the issue of lads who didn't really want to be there, didn't want to be in the Navy, and they were kind of stuck there. Mm. Um, when I went through, out of our entry of direct entry divers, there were quite a few of us, but only two of us actually got uh, badged as clearance divers at the end. There's quite an attrition rate there. And, and obviously, there's a bit of an issue probably that needed addressing. And in order to do that, they, they brought in the, um, the pre-divers acquaint, which I actually thought was quite a good idea. So they would bring civvies. It's almost a bit like the, you know, the Royal Potential War Marines course. Right, yeah. That they go and do when they're still civvies. I think it was a bit like that. They'd bring them to the island. They wouldn't dive, but they would they'd sort of get them swimming around. They'd beach them. They'd, it was about three days long. They'd tell them about the fitness requirements. They'd do the fitness test. They'd go and visit some of the units just to get a better idea of what it was like. So at least they were in a much better position to make a decision about what, if that was what they really wanted to do. We, we lost a guy, a, a guy on day one of the aptitude. He binned it before he'd even done the fitness test because he'd sort of psychologically beaten himself, you know? I think all three services now, over the years, have got more wise to that rather than, you know, adopt more of a train-in select the, rather than select-out a... process. Because so the, that is a, yeah. The, Sorry, mate, go on. Yeah. No, no, go on. Go on, buddy. Apologies. I was just saying, so because they realise they're losing a lot of potential there that with a bit of correct management and guidance would make good, in this case, CDs. Yeah, so I think the attitude at the time was they wanted you to fail, mm. um, especially on the aptitude. And now, I, my understanding is now you're coached through it more. And like, like you say, try to, try to train you in rather than select you out. I don't know if, if that's resulted in a drop in standard. I, I, I couldn't tell you, but I, I mean, the lads have been very active all over the world. And they still seem to be doing business, you know. So. I, don't, I don't think it does drop standard because we've talked about this on other podcasts as well. With that little bit of encouragement, you still get, you still get the same quality of person at the end because it's still hard. Still got to pass yeah. the selection procedures. Still got, you got to pass the standards. You're just yeah. getting encouraged a little bit more rather than... And I'd imagine probably, in the diving environment, there's yeah. literally no place to hide, is there? <laughs> that's, that, well, that's the problem. It, it, if, even if you you could get rid of all of the beasting, um, for instance, but you've still got to do the diving. Yeah. And 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 that, that's the big failure point for a lot of people. Um, yeah, I, I don't think the standard would drop. I think um, it's a selection. It's a more a smarter selection. Yeah. And we've talked about this before. It's a little bit smarter. And you're still only going to get... a roughly a few more than maybe we would have got with the unnecessary beasting or as we found that during our course people failed for some stupid, ridiculous stupid things. things yeah yeah and and that was the way it was as well and, yeah. and, and maybe a bit before my time it was if your face didn't fit you were gone yeah if they didn't like you they would find a way to get rid of you yeah and things have become a little bit fairer over the years um, to be fair, I've heard that the lads now are, are fitter than they've ever been. Um, that probably just goes in line with the way society is now, anyway. Yeah, we do good. I think it's just smarter training and phys- Smart, yeah. physiology knowledge yeah. as well, yeah. isn't it? So, yeah. So once you've got through that initial selection, then how long is the, co- the follow-on course? Of I imagine that's if you want to classify it as trade training in effect. Yeah, it's it's trade training. It's it's still kind of selection procedure in its own right. Um, and you'll, you'll still quite happily get binned at some point throughout it if you, if you don't cut the mustard. It's around six or seven months long. Of course, they've increased in length over time, probably as much as anything due to the kit getting more technical. Just as a point of interest, up until the late 90s, they were basically using a version of the rebreather they were kind of using from the, from the war. Wow. It hadn't really changed. It was a, a mechanical rebreather. It, it had a few modifications over the years and some name changes, but... I think it was pretty much the same kit, the same sort of technology. But I never got to dive it, but the guys that did absolutely loved it. They said there was nothing wrong with it. It was a brilliant swim set. Uh, it was very nice and compact, and it could be rigged for different gas mixes. So it did the job, but um, for whatever reason, they just decided they wanted to move into the kind of the modern era and start using kind of the electronic rebreathers. Yeah, once you've passed the aptitude, you're put into a pool of, of candidates and you're loaded onto a course uh, at the next available date. They run two courses per year. They run a winter course and a summer course. And there's only 10 spots available on each course. So they're small courses. 
and the the instructor to student ratio is very high, obviously, which obviously means that you kind of you can't really hide. Um, I know they like to say be the grey man, but it's a little bit difficult when when you sit, <laughs> when there's only a handful of you kind of thing. And again, like the aptitude, you only get two chances at course, and you can actually be recommended not to come back after the first go. If you've done something particularly egregious um, or some sort of safety violation, they can recommend you don't come back for further training. So the course is it's broken down into different phases. I sort of, I've, I'll say a common thread throughout the whole course is it's very physical. There's a lot of fizz uh, and there's a lot of beasting from the course instructors and from the course PTI as well. And that, that happens irrespective of what phase of training you're in, if you like. There's also, when I went through it, it was quite psychological that you didn't really get a lot of positive feedback. Again, I don't know if that's changed. And also, maybe we were just rubbish, to be honest with you. Who knows? But we, we certainly didn't get a lot of positive feedback when we were doing it. So I run through the course, and the order can vary a little bit, but some things are kind of set in stone. So you, you've got Diving Theory and Physics Week, where you, you sort of, you'll cover sort of various calculations. Uh, you'll cover Archimedes' Principle and Boyle's Law and all that kind of stuff, stuff that I've completely forgotten. And that, that ends with a sort of pass or fail exam at the end of the week. It's actually a fairly cheeky exam. Um, for, for a load of sort of knuckle dragging divers, you know, you then have your, your diver first aid week. During that, you'll cover all of the, the basic stuff you will cover in first aid. So your CPR, defib, um, some battlefield injuries, sucking chest wounds, that kind of thing. And then you also cover um, O2 administration to diving casualties. And you, you go a little bit more into the kind of the diving illness side of things. Uh, you then go into the, the air diving phase of the course, which lasts, I think, about four weeks um, and if you remember earlier, I mentioned ship's divers. You're effectively doing the ship's divers phase here. And at the end of it, you become a ship's diver. You're, you're, you're qualified as a ship's diver, and you actually can start drawing ship's diver's pay while you're going through the rest of your course. It's, it's, uh, the curriculum is basically the same, but you, it's, it's run at a higher intensity, if you like. Uh, so you're, you're doing endless air diving. You're, you're swimming sort of on the short jack stays across the lake or the long jack stays uh, from the school up to the end of the lake, which is 1,000 metres trying to get your endurance up on the set. You, you sort of, you're out of the water, you run around to the nearest charging point, you charge it up and you're back in the water again. You'll learn, you'll learn some sort of basic um, search techniques and stuff while you're doing this. And you'll also go to the set tank, the submarine escape tank in Gosport. Uh, I don't know if you guys have uh, seen that before. No, I haven't seen that, no. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite famous. It's, it's what the submariners use to practice exiting from a submarine, submerged submarine. We kind of do the opposite. We'll go and use that just to do our 30-metre dives in order to get you used to diving air at sort of depth because when you dive air below certain depths, you can start suffering from nitrogen narcosis, known as the narcs, uh, which basically gives you a feeling of kind of uh, either being drunk or euphoria kind of thing. Some people are affected worse than others. And then at the uh, the last week of that phase is spent up uh, up harbour at Portsmouth Harbour, learning to do ships bottom searches uh, in order to sort of search for limpet mines, uh, and you learn how to deploy um, sort of specialist disposal equipment in order to deal with that. It's a challenging phase actually, and uh, obviously the harbour phase is particularly challenging. You're sort of diving day and night, uh, as you are throughout the rest of the course. Uh, obviously being under being at the sort of very bottom of a ship at night time um, where you can't see a lot. It's, it's, it's not for everybody. Yeah, it doesn't sound like my idea of fun. <laughs> no, no. And, uh, very claustrophobic. Yeah, very. it can be. Um, and actually, to be fair, um, it's a bit bit morbid, but the, the deaths we've had in training, um, at least a couple of them around the time I was in were guys that were uh, dying during this phase of the course for whatever reason, they were getting fouled up or, or, or something went wrong. So, you know, it is hazardous. Um, so once you've completed that phase, you, you move into the, the mixed gas rebreather phase. Uh, and this is when you'll, you'll start diving the rebreather that's being used by the branch at the time. There will be other bits of kit you'll learn to use when you go onto other teams, but you'll, this, you'll learn to dive the kind of the bread and butter rebreather set, if you like. When I was in, it was called CDBA. It was the first electronic rebreather the branch had had, stood for clearance diver breathing apparatus. It could go down to 60 metres. And it wasn't a particularly like set. It only lasted about 10 years uh, because it was it was about 10 stone fully weighted. Wow. And they would get you they would get you swimming for hours and hours and hours in this thing. And it, it was it was not a swim set, but we certainly used it as one. Um, and during this phase, as well as learning sort of how to use the rebreather and how to get comfortable in it and the various drills you need to do with it, you also start to touch on the fundamentals of sort of compass swimming and attack swimming in pairs, uh, just the, the sort of uh, 
the procedures and basics of how to do that. At the end of that phase, you then have what's known as living week. This is where you actually live up at the island for a week, basically so they can kick you out of bed whenever they want and, make, and do what they want to you. Uh, you're basically getting beasted uh, day and night and diving day and night during this phase. Sounds quite similar to the sort of the seal hill week that a little bit. Yeah, there probably are similarities. I've heard I've heard to refer as hell week before. Hell week sounds better, doesn't it? Living week, <laughs> typically British. Isn't Very it? British, yeah. Yeah, um, and it's it's probably it's probably sort of a similar milestone, um, if if you like. Um, yeah, you, you get minimal sleep. They have to give you a certain amount of sleep a day, but it's literally like a couple of hours. And some of the tricks they'll use is they'll get you in and they'll put you to bed straight away. And then they'll come, they'll come and wake you up with a thunder flash or whatever, uh, and then you're up for like the best part of 24 hours, kind of thing. Uh, they did that to us. They beasted us in the morning, and then said, "Right, go and get your heads down, boys." So we went and tried to sleep, and after about half an hour, they came crashing in, and we were back up again. And it's uh, it's basically that for a week, and they, they get you doing some sort of weird and wonderful things, like trying to uh, hammer through chains on the seabed for a couple of hours and that kind of thing, just random stuff. They'll get you to come up and they'll be waving the, the off course sort of chits in your face saying, Do you want to sign it? And you're like, No, no. And they sort of get back down then. <laughs> <laughs> so it's that kind of stuff. It's seen as a bit of a milestone on a course. Um, if you get through that, beasting eases up a little bit, not completely, but it does ease up, uh, ease up a little bit. And you're then going into the, the kind of the learning, your trade phase, uh, if that makes sense. So then you, you'll have chamber week. Um, this is just a week of learning to use decompression chambers. Um, learning to operate them basically you then cover underwater welding uh, and hard, hard hat surface applied air diving using the uh, KMB 17 kit we do a bit of underwater engineering and some units do a lot more than others I personally didn't do a huge amount uh, when I was in uh, I think the the army kind of they do more of that kind of stuff you then go into the open water search phase of the course and that's usually held in Portland or, or Falmouth and here you you learn sort of open water grid search techniques, how to conduct body searches and that kind of thing, and uh, very shallow water operation sort of tactics as well. The branch will do uh, sort of body recovery stuff, particularly if um, if you've got a healer that's ditched in sort of deeper water, um, they will be brought in for that. You then move on to Scotland. Uh, this was actually a, a part of uh, the course that I actually enjoyed. We You go up to the Carl of Lochalsh on the west coast of Scotland, near to the Isle of Skye. You spend a number of weeks up there and this is the, the deep phase. So you, you'll, you'll do your 50 meter air dives on the surface supplied equipment uh, and you do your, your deep rebreather stuff and you work up to eventually doing three 60 meter mine hunting dives. As part of the research of the pod, I was just looking at some stuff on the internet and uh, I think sports divers, civvy sport divers go down to 30 meters, don't they? And then, That's correct, yeah. But 60 meters... The risks expand exponentially, and, and 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 one thing I was reading, this guy said the difference between it's like comparing somebody who goes hiking in the Lake District to somebody that's climbing Everest. Essentially, is that a fair analogy? Yeah, it is, and sort of anything underwater is kind of inherently dangerous. And obviously, the deeper you go, the more penalties you're going to kind of incur if things go wrong. Yeah, and you're right. Civvy dives will tend to go to thirty meters, and actually, you don't really want to be diving air too deeply anyway because of the the nitrogen narcosis kind of issues you can have. But yeah, we, at one time we did dive to 80 metres, but then it was it was brought back to 60. Um, I, th I think they realised there wasn't really a need for us to do that, so it, it came back to 60 metres. And yeah, I, I mean, I had a throwing moment. My, my first ever 60 metre uh, dive I did, my kit conked out at about 50 metres completely. I had a total system failure. So I had to go on to my, uh, my emergency gas supply, and at that depth you only have a few breaths. Um, and then I had to go and clag into an external system. And I ended up doing about an hour and a half of O2 stops in the water. So, yeah, it, it can be a bit risky. And with all due respect to the, the rebreather we were using at the time, it, it wasn't always, it wasn't always uh, that great, really. So, yeah, the, the end of that phase, you, you'll generally then sit a pass or fail exam because uh, throughout the course, um, as, as, much, as well as everything else, you, you're also doing a fair bit of diving theory um, here and there, uh, just covering sort of various things. And you, you have a pass or fail exam um, at the end of the deep phase. Uh, and then you go into the explosives phase. And again, this is another phase I actually really enjoyed. You go to what was called Diodes in Chatham, but it's now moved. Uh, Defence uh, Explosive Ordnance Disposal School. And you learn the, the sort of fundamentals of EOD, uh, ammunition identification underwater. You get a lot of input from um, tri-service guys, the so guys from the RAF, guys from the Army, and obviously guys from the Navy. And uh, they bring over guys from the States as well uh, on a swap draft. 
Uh, in fact, my course officer was a, a Navy SEAL randomly um, who, was, who was over on attachment. But um, yeah, during this, you uh, you have a practical exam. They have a little lake there. Basically, you put on a blacked out uh, dive mask and then you dive on various bits of ordnance and you measure them. You're trained to measure them with um, parts of your body, basically. So you, you learn to memorize your, your arm span, your sort of your hand span and the, the length from your elbow to the tips of your fingers. Because obviously, if you're diving in something darker at night time, you're not going to be able to actually use a tape measure or anything. So you have to use parts of your body in, either, in order to try and work out how the dimensions of the thing you're on. Um, and they do a bit of that on course as well. I, I remember one exercise on course, we swam up uh, halfway up the lake and they got us out and they told us to stay on gas, then stuck bin liners over our heads. <laughs> walked us over to some ordnance and got us to kind of measure it out with our with our arms or what have you and then put us back in the lake and we had to dive back and swim back up to the top and then draw what we'd kind of what we what we think we touched basically so yeah so you do you do you do like that exam as i say you've got to draw three bits of ordnance and you kind of you are you are graded a little bit on your ability to draw so if you're not good at drawing you're going to kind of lose some marks mine were okay luckily i did all right so um and then there's also a, a written exam as well that you have to pass um but I'm sure it's a similar in the army. They say if you if you're not cheating, you're not trying hard enough. And we managed to get, <laughs> we managed to get the exam paper somehow the night before, so we we did all right there. Yeah, the secret's um, not to get caught cheating, Jim. Exactly. Well, I th- I th- yeah, I think it's almost expected of you. I think they're almost disappointed if you don't. <laughs> um, and then the final week is the course wash up and the dive badge presentation. Uh, so you you hand all your kit back in, you do your debriefing, and then you you just get a handshake and a welcome to the branch from usually from a captain, a four ringer captain. There's no big sort of deal or anything like that. It's it's literally that. You get your certificate and your badge and that's it. Because like a lot of selection processes, actually you've just got your foot in the door then and really then you're onto your sort of making your mark in the actual unit itself, I'd imagine. Yeah, it's, everything ramps up. You, you kind of, you do the aptitude and think it's not going to get any worse than that. And then the course is far time, you know, far worse. And then you go onto the teams and there's not really a let up in the intensity when you're when you're kind of away on exercise or whatever. It, it doesn't really change. Do you know what I mean? I think people forget that the course only gets you to the start point, exactly, the start yeah. line, and then it all starts from there. Because yeah, then you've exactly. got to actually do the job. A hundred percent. It's just just on the pass rate of the course. It's kind of hard for me to, to gauge that because you have such a high failure rate on the aptitudes. But generally, you'll get an average of probably five of the guys will pass out of the ten. Um, but that can that can change. I remember uh, a guy I knew in the eighties. Everyone on the course passed. Mm-hmm. Um, but then there were a couple of courses just as I was leaving, uh, and everyone failed. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it can really vary. Yeah, I think that's um, from our experience. Our courses were exactly the same. You you either left with the the usual dirty half dozen, or some courses none at all. Yeah. Yeah. So what sort of uh, continuation training did you have to do? You know, you got to the start point, you're all excited, you think it's going to get easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the reality sets in. So, yeah, the, the general route um, is that you, you then get drafted straight onto a mine hunter uh, to do your kind of bread and butter clearance diving stuff. You only do sort of 12 to 18 months of that. Um, most divers, I think it's fair to say, hate being at sea. I actually quite enjoyed it. I had quite a good time personally. But yeah, you, you go and you do your task books, uh, your promotional task books, uh, in order to be promoted from Diver 2 to Diver 1. You put in a preference for what team you want to go to, uh, which land-based team you want to go to, and then you'll be drafted, hopefully, to that unit if you're lucky. And you'll then spend a number of years with that unit. And then generally at that stage, you'll probably go on a promotional course and you'll go back to see it the next rank. And then that goes on until you're a PO diver. Pretty much after PO Diver, you, you kind of don't go to sea again generally. You sort of, you spend the rest of your time on, on the land-based teams. So, yeah, in terms of the, the additional training you do, um, the diving branch is a bit different from probably some other similar units. Um, so you've got Australian clearance divers uh, who do a very sort of similar course to us, but then also as a formal part of their training, they'll go and do parachuting um, and survival, um, escape and evasion and resistance to interrogation training and a land-based tactics course as well. And they do that before they're qualified, whereas we will be qualified as divers, and then we will go and learn additional skills when we go onto the units we go on to. So a few examples of that would be, uh, if you go onto uh, one of the EOD sort of domestic teams, you'll go and do further EOD training. A lot of the lads will learn to become number two operators. So um, you've got the onesie who's there kind of, 
in layman's terms, doing the bomb diffusing, if you like, if that if that's required. Uh, and the 2Z basically acts as a, as, as a backup and an assistant to, to the 1Z. And they learn to drive the wheelbarrow. Um, have you seen those before? They've sort of yeah. used a lot in Northern Ireland and stuff yeah. and that kind of thing. Uh, if you go on to FDU2, or which is now Delta Squadron, you actually have to attend <laughs> numerous survival courses. You've got to go and do the SEER course, the, the Survival Evasion uh, Resistance and Extraction course, which I'm sure you guys would have done as well. Yeah. Remember um, it fondly. <laughs> yeah, fond memories. Yeah. Do you know what? I did mine in the winter and it was just... Uh, well, actually, it, I didn't like the survival bit, but the, I didn't actually mind the escape and evasion bit, to be fair. It's the holding up the wall bit that's the pain. Do you know what? I quite enjoyed that for some reason. I, I actually found that quite interesting. Um, yeah, after what you've been through, mate, that would have been like a, a walk in the park. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it's, uh, we won't put it this way. We, if you failed it, you, it was frowned upon, put it that way. But um, <laughs> but yeah, no, it was. Um, I, I, actually, I actually really enjoyed that course for some reason. And also on that team, you do you do quite a bit of tactics and field craft as well. Certainly, certainly for Matlows, you know. I, I remember we even did one exercise where we were learning to retake a, a fortified emplacement for some reason. I, I don't know why we were practically ever going to use that sort of tactic, <laughs> but um, there was an army guy there watching us, and he was like, "What the hell are you lot doing?" But um, yeah, there was quite a lot of that. And then on that team, you also obviously go more into depth in the the clandestine beach clearance kind of uh, tactics. They did parachute as well up until the early 2000s, but then they, they stopped doing that for sort of budgetary reasons. They might be parachuting again now, though, and a few of the lads also, they can go on the all-arms course as well if they want to um, because of that sort of close working relationship we have with, with obviously, the Marines and, and other units. So uh, Alpha Squadron, the sort of Special Ops Squadron, um, they've got to do various courses, as you'd expect. It usually takes about 18 months uh, to get fully trained up in everything due to the availability of courses and stuff. So that includes the parachute course, uh, the rope access course, which I think actually gives them a, a civil qualification, uh, abseiling training, fast roping, uh, caving ladder work, assault IED training, additional weapons courses and sort of CQB training so they can kind of operate alongside UKSF. Obviously, CQB isn't their primary role when they're in that environment, but they have to sort of, they have to know how to kind of do those tactics. And I think they also do the SEER course. And both the units I just mentioned, uh, they, they do a training and additional diving kit as well, the sort of rebreathers that are used specifically for those units. And then you also get extra training. When, when you go on your promotional courses, you, you'll learn to become diving supervisors. And when you go up to PO diver level, you learn to be a mixed gas supervisor. And they also get additional sort of EOD qualifications as well. That's same, um, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty impressive amount of uh, training you've got to do there. I, I imagine as well, once you're in that sort of work stream, the diving, you're never going to drift back out into wider Royal Navy qualifications or courses? No, you you, you don't. No no one leaves the branch, um, unless obviously they, they're kicked out or, or even if they medically can't do it, they still have a role within the yeah, branch, if you yeah. know what I mean? They're kind of, they, over the years, people have been looked after. Yeah. Um, but no, there's really, there's not anywhere else to go with, with the best will in the world, other than some guys, they'll, they'll go and um, sort of give SF a go kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, why would you? You've been through all that. I imagine as well. You know, the the, the pay must make a difference as well. And do you yeah, have to be in, do you have to be enrolled to hold on to that pay as well? Yeah. So you, um, throughout your career, you have to get a minimum amount of minutes every quarter. You've got to be able to pass the diving fitness test every year, um, and the, the standards stay the same even when you're older, kind of thing. But yeah, you you get. I mean, if you're on one of if you're on one of the right units, you could be drawing your special service pay diving your mixed gas supervisor's pay uh, and your parachute pay. Mm. And then also obviously additional pay for being overseas and stuff as well that you get. So you can do quite well out of it, to be fair. So Jim, what sorts of operations um, did the branch go out and support? Yeah, so the, the branch has been involved, as I say, in every every major conflict, really, um, certainly in recent years. Um, I'll kind of, I'll go back to the Falklands and sort of work from there. But they during the Falklands War, they they had a, a pretty good war, to be fair, as far as wars go. Um, Major General Julian Thompson, the commander of three commando uh, in, in the Falklands, uh, he actually said that the clearance diving branch were the kind of the mystery unit of the Falklands war and not, not the SAS, which is obviously quite an accolade to have from a man like him. Um, but during that war, they were involved in sort of uh, EOD operations sort of at sea and on land. They were rendering safe Argentinian bombs that had been uh, dropped into ships and not not uh, exploded. 
Um, and there was quite so, a lot of them, wasn't there? Because the Argentinians were fused, they were having to attack that low that their armourers were setting the bomb fuses wrongly, not knowing how 100%, low. 100%. Yeah, you're 100% right. They um, they were very brave. The Argentinian pilots are very skilled. Uh, I think there's obviously a bit of a misconception about the quality of some of the Argentinian military. They, they were they were good at what they did. Um, it's just lucky that the, the, the bombs didn't detonate because we would have lost a lot more. Mm. Um, so, yeah, there were quite a few of those bombs they had to render safe. And, in fact, um, a couple of Army EOD guys actually got killed doing it. I think what happened was they, they used a thing called a rocket wrench de armor, which basically uh, spins a fuse on a bungee out of a bomb really quickly so it can't arm. That sounds really Heath Robinson. <laughs> that, that, is, that is definitely Second World War. Yeah. You know, yeah, that, salt water yeah. into it and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, exactly. And that, do you know what? That hasn't really changed a lot. Um, but, yeah, no, they, they did that, and um, I think it was actually a, a reverse thread, and they actually wound it into the bomb. Uh, I think that's how it happens. Yeah, it was very tragic, but but yeah, they did that. Um, they did a lot of lot of swim throughs on ships because uh, a lot of the naval ratings kept thinking they were seeing uh, frogmen under the boats and stuff. They did some beach recce work alongside uh, SF, and then as the war was kind of drawing down, they did a lot of IED uh, sort of clearance clearance of booby traps in houses where the Argentinian soldiers had been. And then there was a it was a, a top secret operation at the time, but operation I think it's called Black Bag, where a, a dive team sort of had to quickly get worked up in uh, training, sat diving, and go and dive on HMS Coventry in order to go and recover uh, the crypto uh, machine. Uh, that must have been a hell of a task. That yeah, yeah. I, I, someone sent me a, a bit about it. I was just reading through, thinking, God, that that must have been horrendous. They're working at extreme depths in sort of a a dark uh, environment, cluttered with with everything, you know, yeah. it'd have been very easy to have got yourself snagged up on stuff and get yourself disorientated. Um, but they, they did that and they were very successful at it. And obviously, you, you know, you've got some of your colleagues floating around in there as well. Yeah. Horrendous. Uh, yeah. Really horrendous stuff. And they also uh, took out the, some of the sea darts were actually armed still from the attack. Uh, so they had to blow those up as well. If you actually, if anyone wants a good read, there's a book by Tony Groom called uh, diver, which was released in 2008. And he was a clearance diver and he talks about his time in the branch and his time during the Falklands War, uh, and then his time as a commercial diver afterwards. It's, it's a really good book. It's, it's very funny, but it also just gives you a good idea of what the war was like at the time. It was kind of World War II like to be honest with you. As much as, much as that conflict was, but honestly, mate, that's the first time I've heard about the involvement of the clearance divers there, and I'll, I'll put a link to that book on the podcast notes for listeners as yeah, well. Yeah, you should. It was, it, was, it was actually a bestseller. I think he did quite well out of it, but um, it's, it's well worth a read. It's really good. They're, yeah, they were then involved in the first Gulf War. They did sort of sea mine clearance there, uh, lots of land-based EOD, especially in, in Kuwait. And there was for a small amount of guys, they got a lot of medals out of that war, actually, and the Falklands as well, to be fair. They also were involved in operations in the Balkans sort of during the 90s. Um, and then in the 2003 invasion of Iraq, quite a large portion of the branch was sent out there, and they had various roles during that kind of phase of the war. Um, quite a lot of land and water-based EOD they were involved in clearing Basra Harbour because um, that was kind of littered with mines. They were doing some VSW sort of beach clearance work with uh, the Americans. The Americans have got a unit called NSC T1, who we did a fair bit of stuff with. Naval Special Clearance Team 1 It's made up of Navy EOD uh, divers, uh, Marine Recon divers, uh, SEALs, uh, and also the mammal unit, the dolphins. Have you, have you seen those on the news before? Yeah, I, I saw that a couple of years ago, and it's something out of a science fiction book. Yeah, yeah, they, they've been using them. Uh, I, I trained with them when I was out in Hawaii, um, and they, they've been using them for, for years, I think even since the 60s. Yeah, it's, it is a real thing. Uh, but I get the way I try to explain it is we use dogs. Don't we use working yeah. dogs. They're arguably more intelligent than dogs are, so yeah. And then they, they were also doing some recce work as well um, with the SEALs and... and um, uh, five, is it 539 Assault Squadron from the Marines? Uh, they're doing some work up the Euphrates, right, uh, some yeah. recce stuff. Then around 2006, um, the branch then again started to send sort of small two to four man units uh, to both Iraq and Afghanistan eventually to make uh, make up part of the Joint Force EOD capability, as it was known. And they were there really to augment the army because the army were obviously taking on the weight of that task. And we provided sort of number one and number two operators to go out there. Uh, and also... Um, some guys in the branch actually got trained as high threat IED operators as well. And that's the first time that um, the Navy's done that. What does that mean, Jim? So I'm not too familiar with that term. So, yeah, so dealing with um, dealing with your sort of most sophisticated kind of terrorist devices, uh, if you like. Um, and we didn't have we didn't uh, have high threat operators previously. 
Um, they, they were sort of the preserve of the army. Um, obviously, they had a lot of work out in Northern Ireland as well back in the day. Yeah, we, we were kind of out there, I think, pretty much until the drawdown in both of those conflicts uh, in one way or another. And also the branch has been routinely really deploying to the Middle East since obviously sort of 2001. We've had CDs in that region sort of almost permanently uh, to one degree or another since that day. And in 2006, they actually moved a squadron of mine hunters from the UK to be permanently based over in Bahrain. And you have uh, the crew does sort of six month rotations out there uh, to obviously keep the, the shipping lanes clear uh, out in that sort of neck of the woods. And they also had some involvement in some, uh, some other operations in sort of North Africa as well. So yeah, they've, they've been busy. Mate, that's a really interesting uh, listen there, and it's really opened my eyes up to the capabilities of uh, clearance divers. And, you know, again, the involvement in the Falklands, I had absolutely no idea to that degree of involvement in the Falklands. Yeah, and I probably didn't, to be fair, I probably didn't really do them justice there. They, they, they did a hell of a lot uh, and obviously took a lot of risks. And uh, yeah, get, get that book by Tony Groom. It'll, it'll give you a good outline of it. Yeah, I'll I'm, definitely I'm sure, do that, mate. I'm sure I read something recently that the there's a Royal Navy one of your guys did a bomb disposal in the Falklands and he got the first DSC for an other rank yeah and I'm sure he's got is it Mick is it Mick he's got he's got DSC an MBE and a BEM for gallantry yeah he's been doing EOD work forever and he was the first Royal Navy other rank to be awarded DSC because that's you in those days it was an officer's award. Yeah, I think he was a. Was he ended up being a warrant officer? I think, That's it. Yeah, end. yeah. Tied yeah. as a warrant officer. And diver. I just saw it the other day, and I was just reading about him, and it was um, unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think I know you talk, I think he might have actually written a book himself. I don't know. I, I just come across it. I, I know. I knew we were doing this podcast. And I thought, oh. I'll have to mention well, that. Well, talking of books, that leads us nicely on to Desert Island Ditch, which will be Jim's choice of book, film and luxury item. So, Jim, what have you picked? Yeah, so for the book choice, it's a book I, I initially read uh, in the sort of late 90s when it came out when I was a sort of young lad, and I read it again recently. It's called Death of a Hero by uh, a guy called John Parker. It's about uh, Captain Robert Nyrak, who was awarded a George Cross. Uh, I'm assuming for your guys' backgrounds and time in the army, you're probably aware of him. Yeah, very well aware. Yeah, it, um, he was a very interesting character. Um, this guy, he 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 was a grenadier guardsman, and he came from sort of quite a posh background, and he, he went to Oxford University. But he was he was quite interesting. Uh, on a gap year, he actually tr- travelled around with a, an Irish fair uh, as their boxer, and actually did some bare knuckle boxing fights and stuff. So he, he was an interesting character. He was quite a tough guy. Um, and he sort of he found himself in in the kind of the covert war, if you like, in Northern Ireland. There's a lot of there's a lot of rumor and speculation about him. A lot of accounts of him being in the SAS and stuff. And I don't think any of that was true at all. He was he was operating out there as a, a military intelligence liaison officer between the army and special branch in the police. And this was the 1970s, the early 1970s, when, when things were a little bit not as organised. Things were a little bit way, a little bit where, as they yeah, say, aren't they? Yeah. They, yeah. I think uh, I, I think some of the things, some of the rumours about him are probably true. Um, I think he went he went south of the border a few times when he wasn't supposed to, and and that kind of thing. And he and I think he probably did step out of his bounds a bit, uh, and then tragically he, he he really overstepped his bounds and he, he went um, he went to the three steps in in South Armagh and tried to pass himself as, off as an Irishman. And Absolute madness when you think about it. Yeah, complete madness. Um, I, I never, well, to be fair, I have been to Northern Ireland, but I never deployed there in, in a, in a sort of military capacity, really. Um, but obviously, South Amara at the time was a proper no go area yeah. <laughs> for anybody. And I think he'd kind of got away with doing similar stuff before. Um, so I don't think it was the first time he'd done it. But but yeah, he, he got clocked by three sort of wannabe provos, really. Uh, and he was um, abducted. And taken south of the border and, and sort of tragically severely beaten and, and executed but he maintained his cover story throughout the whole time and that even the guys that sort of murdered him said he was a very brave guy and he was awarded a george cross as a result of that but the book's not not so much about that it's more about his life and, and what he did before that and it's, it's quite an interesting book about quite an interesting person who would have probably gone on to, done, to do some sort of some pretty amazing things if he if obviously not that hadn't happened to him they still haven't found his body have they no, that's right. He's, he's no. still classed as one of the disappeared, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. Um, and there's rumours about, obviously, what happened to him there as well. Yeah, not very nice ones. So, film choice then? I, I like this one, actually. I've not seen this one for years. Yeah, so <laughs> I was trying to think. It's, it's, do you know what? Out of all the questions, this, this is a difficult one because uh, 
you, as you get older, you have a lot of films you like, but Gross Point Blank from 97, it's a film I can just quite happily watch over and over again. It stars you know, John Cusack and Dan Aykroyd and Minnie Driver. And uh, it's, a, it's a comedy, a sort of black comedy uh, about a hitman who has to go back to his hometown after 10 years to go and sort of kill somebody. And while he's there, he tries to hook up with his his ex uh, his ex girlfriend, and he goes to his high school, and it's uh, it's a high school union. Yeah, it's a, it's a good film. It's yeah, well no, worth a watch. I agree with that. It's a good choice that. And uh, being a Matlow, I'm surprised this is what you've picked for your luxury item, mate. I think. Oh, you you, I go for, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I thought I thought it'd been a rom. <laughs> I let myself down there, didn't I? I let myself down. <laughs> yeah, so I'd, I sort of figure I, I was going to do. I'd be clever, and I sort of try and bring a survival tin or something like that. And I thought, nah. I'm going to bring a bottle of Lagavulin, sort of 16 year old single malt scotch. <laughs> and, I'm, you know, I might as well have a good time uh, if I'm in that sort of dire situation and try and remember some of it, some of the, the survival training I had years and years ago. It'll be all right diving for fish in that, mate, with your training. Yeah, I guess so, yeah. I haven't done it for a while, though. So, yeah. Best survival tool, a credit card. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> so, Kev, I know, I know we stole your thunder. Well, I didn't. Uh, you know, well, uh, Jim I'll, stole I'll your thunder, really. What's I apologise. <laughs> some of it. Obviously, my choice is a film. A film based on the Royal Navy, Lionel Buster Crab, OBE, George Medal. Mentioned earlier in the episode, and it was a real boy's own story as well, and the mystery of his death or disappearance. So in 1958, a film called The Silent Enemy with Lawrence Harvey. He depicted Crab and the operations in Gibraltar, so they covered the Italian piece. And this was based on the, the, the book by Marshall Pugh, Commander Crab. So there is a book there as well for people to read. And at the start of the Second World War, uh, Lord of Crab was an army gunner, so he was in the Royal Artillery. Oh, there you go. I never knew there that. You go. So in, but in 1941, he joined the Royal Navy, and a year later he was sent to Gibraltar where he worked in a mine and bomb disposal unit to remove the Italian Olympic mines that the enemy divers had attached to the hulls of our ships as uh, has been mentioned earlier in the podcast. Um, and it was very much amateurish. They didn't have the training. They just got on with it like everyone does. They learnt it was on-the-job training. And I think you mentioned it as well. They originally dived with submarine survival apparatus, but they obviously used it in a reverse way. And then they, they borrowed some of the Italian divers when they obviously captured or killed them. Um, and I think it was him and another guy called Sidney Knowles, BEM, who served with him. And then after the war, the disappearance of Buster Crab, both of them were working for supposedly MI6, and they were operating around Soviet ships. And on one of the Soviet ships, Crab disappeared after a dive in Portsmouth Harbour in 1956. A body was found 14 months later, but Knowles, his, his partner did not identify it as Crab. So there was an open verdict at the time, but then the coroner announced that they were satisfied that that was Buster Crab's um, or Lionel Crab's body. And so the mystery remains because Knowles is convinced that it wasn't Buster Crab. Okay, Kev, okay, thanks. Uh, my choice then, keeping on the diving theme, is a book called The Last Dive by Bernie Chowdhury. And I don't know what a diver would make of this, but I really enjoyed it. It was one of those, I was coming through uh, the airport in Iraq and I picked it up because it's on the book of, one of those tables laden with books. Saw it, picked it up, took it on the plane and I finished it by the time we got to the other end, which admittedly with RAF is about 24 hours anyway, so I had plenty of time to read it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's about a father and son, Chris and Chrissy Rose, who started out as cave divers. And I tell you what, Jim, you know, you talked about what you're doing as well. I've got no idea why people want to do cave diving as a sport. Yeah, I, 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 do you know what? I kind of, I'm inclined to agree with you on that one, <laughs> despite my background. <laughs> Bloody hell, coming from you then, that just shows you. <laughs> uh, and they're also wreck divers. And, and what it brings out then is, is the sort of the competition that was pushing them on and on and further in the, the, the diving. And they died while attempting to retrieve the captain's logbook of a U-boat sunk off the coast of New Jersey at a depth of 70 metres. And they were experienced tech divers. They were used to using Trimex, but they chose to dive on compressed air as Trim Trimex was too expensive. And I now even know better the greater folly of that when you're talking about the 60 meter issue that you mentioned earlier on, Jim, as well. So essentially, they died chasing a trophy to make a name for themselves. And there's lots of horror stories in this book. Uh, and I, I'd like to 
asked Jim about the veracity of this what bit I read in it. So they said, uh, in the early days of diving, uh, men at the surface pumped air into the diver's suits, but when they, the equipment or the compressor failed, and if the diver was deep enough, his head would be squeezed up into his helmet and reduced to like a mush. Could that happen, or is that just? Yeah, I mean, if uh, if you're at the if you're deep enough and you don't have, uh, for instance, that pressure going into your lungs in order to keep them inflated or whatever, um, it, it, may, it might well be able to happen. Yeah, if you're, if you're at sort of an extreme depth. Another reason to stay on dry land, mate. I would never made a mat low. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's I've never I've actually never heard of that book. Sounds very interesting. Um, and yeah, obviously the, the stuff about Buster Crab that was always sort of uh, spoken about in the branch. The sort of rumours about it. No, I mean, it's a brilliant film, brilliant story. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a good, it's a good little film. It's got Sid Owen in it, isn't it? It's, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. Sid yeah, James. Yeah. So, so sorry, not Sid, Sid Owen. James. Yeah, but it's a, <laughs> but it's um, I think it goes back to that original part where during the Second World War, all these little specialist units were forming. They were grabbing what they could do, what, what kit they needed, and they just made do with what they had. To achieve, you know, but even then, remarkable. diving was totally in its infancy. I mean, Jacques Cousteau well, is a sort of the father of scuba diving, but was that in the eighteen thirties, Jim? I don't know. Was it? Oh. Yeah, sort of. Obviously, they've been doing that kind of, you know, this, the hard hat diving for quite a long time. But this kind of, this more sort of like diving with a set on, as we would recognise it today, that was still really in its infancy. Yeah, at that point yeah. in time. Yeah, and 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 I, I, I line of crab. I don't believe it was a trained diver. He just learnt on the job. He learned on the job, yeah, you know, and ended so, up being you know, one of the founding guys, kind of. Amazing when you think about it. We just, you know, had these people just throwing themselves into a into a dock, searching underneath in the dark, looking for a ship, uh, mines on board, uh, Olympic mines on on the ship, and also dealing with Italian divers at the same time who had the best kit. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah. Um... Yeah, it's crazy when you sort of think about it. But that's that's what it was. They'd have these signs on the notice board saying we want people for uh, special duties of hazardous nature, you know. And um, it, was, it was those that were crazy enough to, to sign up to it. Well, thank you again, Jim, for coming to uh, coming down to the podcast and telling us your story. And thank you again to the listener for coming and listening to our story and your continued support and suggestions. Please keep them coming on our email and social media links, which are at the bottom of our show notes. You can find us on all the usual suspects, post office, stamp, envelope, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And if you download us from iTunes or any other uh, area and like the podcast, it'd be great if you could leave us a, a good review. Uh, or any, But if you're going to give us a bad review, don't bother. <laughs> and yes, yes, again, thanks again to Nick Beal for his continuing support to the series and offering technical help to, through his company, ISAR. See you next time on The Unconventional Soldier.